Dear Game Freak, Hi, it's me, Austin! What's up? You still haven't written back to me about your Pokeballs. That's okay, I understand. You want to suppress the truth about the systematic genocide of an entire species? I probably would too if I were in your shoes. I wouldn't want people to know the truth about Pokeballs if I were the sole benefactor of their existence, but that's not why I'm writing to you today. I've already said all there is to say about your Pokeballs. No, actually, I'm writing to you to address something I said in my last video that, well, honestly, I didn't put that much thought into, but definitely, DEFINITELY CREATED WAVES! I said that your anime was bad, and you know, in my defense, almost everything I love to watch as a kid is not nearly as charming and has not aged well. I'm looking at you, X-Men! But you know, I noticed that the miraculous success of Pokemon Go has launched the series back into the main stage limelight, and as a result, Netflix picked the show up. So, I gave it another watch, and you know what? I was wrong. If I'm being entirely honest, Pokemon is actually a pretty genuinely interesting and entertaining show, and even funny! Hell, even the Western dubbing isn't that bad. It's not, you know, great, but it's totally not terrible. At least not Sailor Moon terrible. I am Tuxedo Mask. Of course, watching your show again as an adult ignited my pedantic science brain, and I just... I have a sickness. I can't stop. I can't... STOP MYSELF! I was watching the show, and Pikachu blew up a goddamn building two episodes in, so I had to ask myself, exactly how fucking strong is Pikachu? Could a Pikachu exist in our real world? I NEED TO KNOW! Of course, we're a video game channel and not an anime channel, so maybe this isn't the right thing to talk about. But fuck you! I can do what I want! Plus, there are surprisingly lengthy debates on the internet about whether or not Ash's Pikachu itself is particularly special, with most people generally concluding that Ash's Pikachu isn't that spectacular, other than spectacularly adorable, that is. So I think it's pretty fair to say that for the most part, in spite of Team Rocket's misplaced fascination, Ash's Pikachu is pretty emblematic of the normal capability of the average or perhaps even above average Pikachu in the Pokemon universe. At least that's the story I'm telling myself. Now let's do this! Pikachu, like Rattata, is a rodent. A mouse though, kinda. Although to be entirely honest, it looks a little bit more like a cockatiel than a mouse as far as markings go. It's one of the original 151 Pokemon and actually is one of the earliest cool Pokemon you could get in Pokemon Red and Blue. A sparse population of Pikachu inhabit Viridian Forest, although they're incredibly rare and most people pass through the area without ever seeing one. Pikachus have pretty awesome powers other than being adorable as fuck though. They're an electric type Pokemon and can deliver incredibly potent shock attacks into their opponents. The Pokedex entry states that they have organs in their cheeks that are capable of <laughs> storing electric energy and that if sufficient numbers of them are gathered in one place they can actually produce goddamn lightning storms. This is bullshit, right? Well, You'll just have to wait and see. Before going into the specifics of Pikachu, let's talk about electricity and animals in our real world for a second. There are actual animals in our real world that use electricity as a weapon. I mean, you probably knew this already, but when I was a kid, I was convinced these things were a fabrication. I'm talking, of course, of electric eels. Amusingly enough, electric eels aren't actually related to eels at all. They actually belong to the knife fish family. Regardless, electric eels are fucking incredible. You see, all animals on our planet actually do produce electricity. You do, I do, my dog does. It's how our cells work to transfer energy. We do this through something called the sodium potassium pump process, where a cell pushes three sodium ions to one side of a membrane and pulls two potassium ions into the other side. It does this over and over and over over again, which creates an unbalanced charge transfer, giving the side with more potassium ions a negative charge and the one with sodium ions a positive charge. Fucking cool, right? Now, in our bodies, this charge is created and dissipated asynchronistically, oftentimes almost as soon as it's created. In either case, without this process, we wouldn't be able to flex our muscles, breathe, or even think. But while we waste our electric potential powering our oversized brains, electric eels decided to dump all their attribute points into badass and as a result have bent this biological process to their fucking 
Wills. Eels use this same sodium potassium exchange to create a charge in a cell called an electrocyte. Eels flood these electrocytes with potassium and hold them there until they're ready to be used. When an eel is ready to discharge its electricity, the ion gates open, sodium floods into the electrocyte cells and lets loose a tiny shock of point. 1, 5 volts. Of course, that's just one cell, but an electric eel has thousands of these cells all arranged in series and literally wired with nerve cells to a pacemaker nerve cluster that's capable of coordinating the release of all these cells simultaneously. So instead of a low voltage charge slowly pissing out of their body, an eel is capable of unleashing over six 100 volts into the surrounding area, fucking murder fucking every goddamn piece of prey in the vicinity. It's an incredible feat of evolution. So an animal using the powers of science to fuck their enemies up isn't actually unheard of. So could a mammal do this? Totally. Could a Pikachu? Hell yeah, of course. Well, I mean, that's not enough, is it? Oh, a Pikachu could shock somebody. What kind of ending to a science episode is that? No! Here at the Shoddy Cast Labs, we won't rest until we have all the answers. And the answers are, say it with me now, God damn terrifying. So we've established that animals can shock people, but Pokemon don't just, you know, accomplish boring everyday feats that can be easily mimicked by sticking a fork in a live outlet, no! Pokemon are effectively gods that walk among us, so just how large of a shock is Pikachu capable of delivering? A fucking massive one. Of course, in the second episode of the Pokemon anime, Pikachu blows up an entire building, but this actually appears to be due to the electricity igniting volatile gases expelled by coughing. The frames of reference are few and far apart, but there are two notable displays of power we can absolutely measure perfectly. In the episode, on a wingle and a prayer, we see a Pikachu blow the goddamn top off a mountain. And again, in the episode Unova's survival crisis, a Pikachu rips apart a goddamn stone temple. Jesus Christ! Okay, um, shit, where to start? The temple, of course. Mountains are made up of all sorts of shit. Different gradients of rock, minerals, dirt, trees, fuck all, whereas ancient temples were predominantly constructed from one material in one quarry. This temple in Pokemon mostly resembles the structures built by the ancient Maya civilization in Mexico and Central America, which were predominantly comprised of local limestone. Buried deep in the south of Mexico are the ruins of the giant Mayan city Calakmul, in which is one of the tallest surviving Mayan temples Temples, uncreatively called Structure 2. Calcumul Structure 2 towers above all nearby landmarks at 55 meters and is constructed with a terrifyingly heavy 3 million kilograms of limestone. This is our placeholder for the Pokemon Temple that's reduced to rubble by one shock from a particularly agitated Pikachu. How does electricity even render something this massive structurally unstable? Simple. Thermal shock. Thermal shock is something a substance experiences when portions of it change temperature dramatically. A good way to illustrate this while simultaneously irritating anybody you live with is to place a glass or mug in your freezer overnight, boil some water over the stove, and drop the glass into the hot water. The zero degree glass will come into contact with water that's 100 degrees and the surface of the glass will immediately expand while the inner portions of the glass will remain rigid. This will create internal tension within the glass, which at these high temperatures will over overcome the glass's ability to maintain its shape and it will fracture. If you heat the glass up slowly enough though, this actually won't happen because the material has time to expand and move out of the way of nearby molecules at a much less alarming rate. So easy peasy, we just have to use electricity to heat up the stone until it fractures. Awesome! Uh, how the fuck would you do that though? I mean, electric energy is based on the flow of electrons through a medium, whereas heat is a form of quantum kinetic energy stored in molecules a la incredibly tiny vibrations. How on earth do electrons heat something up? Resistance. You see, almost every material in the universe, aside from some very interesting and notable exceptions that aren't relevant to talk about right now, have electric resistance. For example, copper has a pretty low electric resistance compared to, oh, I don't know, rubber, which has an incredibly high electric resistance. That's why wires are frequently copper wrapped in rubber. The low resistance of copper allows electrons to move more freely, whereas the high resistance of rubber keeps the electricity contained, both for safety, but also practical reasons. That being said, even substance 
substances with incredibly high resistance aren't completely immune to the flow of electrons. If you were to pump enough voltage through the same copper wire, eventually it would override the insulating effect of the rubber. At the end of the day, resistance is relative. Everything is capable of transporting electrons, it just depends upon how persistent the electrons happen to be. Anyway, whenever electron passes through something, the substance resists a little bit, and when this happens, the electric energy that's held back is transformed into heat energy. This is exactly how things like space heaters and electric stovetops work. Electricity is transported through substances with a high-ish electric resistance, and the electrons impart heat energy into the medium, creating heat which is used to warm the space up or cook food. In order to figure out how our Pikachu reduces a limestone temple to rubble, we need to know four things. The total mass of the temple, and the specific heat capacity, thermal shock parameter, and the electric resistance of limestone. Not all of these things are readily available in your average textbook, but here at the Shoddy Cast, we stop at nothing! And thankfully, there's a very small yet detailed segment of scientists that have devoted a lot of time and energy to studying limestone. Limestone is an incredible material, actually. Limestone is a sedimentary rock, which means it's formed by various particles that have been smooshed together by terrestrial pressure. Specifically, limestone is formed by the skeletal remains of ancient coral, shellfish, and other marine life. Limestone has really interesting thermal properties in that it's actually quite resistant to thermal shock and fracturing. This is because its specific makeup of calcium carbonate allows it to easily dissipate heat energy, and it's also much softer than a lot of other rock, which allows it to expand when exposed to high heats very quickly. For this reason, limestone is used in the production of steel and high-end ceramics. That being said, it's not immune to thermal shock by any means, and if you heat it up by over 800 Kelvin very quickly, it's guaranteed to fracture. Remember earlier when I said that thermal fracturing occurs when one section of a material expands from heat faster than cooler locations? This means that in order to crumble our temple, we don't actually have to heat all of it. 40% will do. Given a specific heat capacity of 0.907, this means that our Pikachu needs to impart a whopping 1.04 gigajoules of energy into this monolith almost instantly. Limestone has a resistance of 10 MILLION OHMS! Plugging in all our numbers, this means that our Pikachu is blasting this temple with the power of Zeus himself with over 14 billion volts and a current of nearly 1.5 thousand amps. This is quite literally like producing a fucking lightning bolt like a real one, which has a higher amperage but also a much lower voltage, ranging in the 1 billions. This incredibly high voltage is necessary for the current of 1,000 amps to actually travel through the temple and impart its energy directly into the stone, causing it to crumble and shatter beneath the Olympian might of a fucking mouse! Keep in mind that to produce a real lightning bolt, we need fucking storm systems that extend into the goddamn stratosphere and cover miles of ground in order to build up the energy to strike the ground! And even then, this Pikachu is capable of pushing this electricity through stone, not just at it. These temples can withstand actual comparatively low voltage thunderstorms, but a fucking cartoon mouse can wreck their shit. And remember our electric eel, which produces a current using electrocyte cells and the sodium potassium pump? Yeah, fuck, in order to do this, Pikachu would need nearly 10 billion electrocyte cells aligned in series compared to the electric eel's several thousand. But even more terrifying, Pikachu would have to displace over 500 kilograms or over 1,000 pounds of electrolytes in order to produce this current. In order to maintain this electrolyte balance, Pikachu would have to have as many electrolytes in his system as 6.2 million bottles of Gatorade. That's over half as many that are bought and sold in the entire United States every day. And that's just for one shock. For more than that, we're talking about a Pikachu that would resemble a fucking Snorlax more than a giant rodent. That should be one fat motherfucking Pokemon. Fuck! No wonder he won't go inside a fucking Pokeball. He's not only afraid of quantum murder, he probably can't even fucking fit. Jesus Christ! Sincerely, Austin. P.S. Hi, it's me again, Austin. Here to talk to you about our organization, Stop Killing Pokemon. Stop Killing Pokemon was originally founded to spread the Pokeball-free lifestyle, but has expanded into all forms of Pokemon abuse and death, including electrolyte overextension by electric-type Pokemon for self-destruction of Voltorbs and the telescoping of flying Pokemon spines when they're coercing of flying trainers across the country on their backs. Pokemon are living, breathing creatures, and our culture has to join the 21st century and stop this horrendous treatment of our fellow living creatures, except for shelters. Shelters are 
they're just the worst. If you want to know more about protecting Pokemon near you, head on over to www.stopkillingpokemon.org. Stopkillingpokemon.org was created using Squarespace, which made it incredibly easy to make an attractive, professional, and modern looking website. With membership comes a free custom domain name like stopkillingpokemon.org and adding a storefront to buy potions and ethers to care for your downtrodden Pokemon is incredibly easy. They have gorgeous templates that make it a snap to make a website either for your poor electrically deformed Pokemon or for other things like a photography studio or a bakery. If you want to try Squarespace, head on over to squarespace.com shoddy or use the promo code shoddy for a 10% discount. All proceeds may or may not go to helping poor Pokemon in an area near you and helping spread the word about the Pokeball free lifestyle. Oh, and head on over to our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash shoddycast. Last week was our first week of the Shoddycast Amateur Tournament, and we're taking a week off to get the schedules aligned, so right now I'm going to be streaming competitive Overwatch in my new apartment, which is very echoey. Whatever. Just means I'll sound like God now. Awesome. That's twitch.tv slash shoddycast. Come hang out with me while I throw zen balls into people's faces. Thank you everyone for watching my video about Pikachu! Holy moly! This one was a little bit more detailed than I probably made it look in the video, but this one took me like four days to get right. On top of being in a new apartment where everything's all weird, and my recording space is weird, and I couldn't figure out what to do, so I'm actually, I'm gonna show right now, take a picture, that I'm actually in my, uh, my future baby's room, recording in here, so as you can hear some of the echo there. Anyway, I'd like to throw out a personal thank you to our Patreon supporters who make this show possible. You guys are awesome. Um, yeah, if you have any other science questions about video games you want me to answer, just ask me in the comments below. And yeah, I'm gonna go make this episode now. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. What a weird phrase that we came up with, bye.